Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 52 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random garbage. To get us started, hear this week's top news highlights Tokyo Olympics to pay up to $2,700 per day for each venue official. Japan's Liberal Democratic Party to consider establishing a children's agency. After discussions, school kids in Japan choose to eat flounders they raised. This week in Japan. All right, so our first story Tokyo Olympics to pay up to $2,700 per day for each venue official. The Mainichi has reported that as much as 300,000 yen, which is about $2,700 US dollars per person per day has been estimated for spending on contracting companies running venues for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. While the Tokyo Organizing Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games maintains that the consignment fee estimate it drew up were numbers for consideration and that there was no way it placed orders for these amounts, the actual figure spent has yet to be publicly disclosed. So at the Tokyo Olympics, 339 events in 33 sports will be contested at 42 venues across nine prefectures nationwide. Each venue requires staff to fulfill duties, including guiding spectators and responding to the media, and the organizing committee entrusts the work to private companies. The documents obtained appear to have been created before March 2020, ahead of the decision to delay the games by a year, and they present a scenario in which a full event is held without controls on audience members. A total of nine firms are named as taking on this work, primarily major advertising firms and event management companies. <coughs> Dentsu. <coughs> <laughs> Who? <laughs> the consignment fees come to a total of about 16.39 billion yen, that's about 148 million USD, for the 42 venues. A price that appears to be around over 10% higher than the amounts envisaged by the organizing committee. Among them, costs for managing the services at Musashino Forest Sport Plaza in Tokyo's Chofu City came to around 530 million yen, or about 4.8 million USD. With a daily 300,000 yen to be spent on unified operators and 200,000 yen, which is about 1,800 US dollars, on chiefs and directors. So they're going to spend 4.8 million USD on a forest? No, no, no. It's on the staffing of this plaza, the sport plaza. Ah, okay, It just okay. has a dumb name the Musashino <laughs> Forest Sport Plaza. I'm imagining, you know, in Japan, they take great care to, like, you know, cut the trees and everything.、I'm、yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a forest. It's a, you know, it costs money. <laughs> Gotta make sure the trees are all nice and pretty, right? Yikes, yikes. But I mean, no, I mean, you know, three grand a day, it's a pretty sweet deal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this has hit the news pretty hard because people. People are saying, wait, why are these guys making so much money? And already on Twitter, several people are saying, well,、uh, where do you sign up to get these sweet digs? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's all going to Japanese private companies, too.、Um, it's interesting. I, I read recently, I think、uh, the Japan's national、uh, debt now exceeds、uh, one quadrillion yen. So,、um, yeah, I mean, looking at all these expenses for the Olympics. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I hope stuff、uh, evens out in the end. Well, you know, when it comes to these expenses, obviously, you know, $2,000 a day just seems like a lot of money, right?、Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about how many hours that comes down to, and it's pretty expensive. But if you think of it as 
fees that are getting paid for kind of one-time things to consulting companies, it's not totally out of the question, but Mm. obviously it adds up and it adds up to a pretty decent amount of money. For sure. And of course, the companies that are going to be receiving this money happen to be the very companies that people love to point their finger at and say, hey, you guys are taking all the government's money. You must be doing some illegal stuff. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But I mean, at this point, you know, the Olympics is uh, sunk cost, so. (laughs) (laughs) Who gets to pay for it? (laughs) We do. (laughs) Hopefully it doesn't turn into a sunk ship. (laughs) Up next, Japan's Liberal Democratic Party to consider establishing a, quote, children's agency. NHK has reported that the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, Koichi Hagiuda has expressed his support for establishing a children's agency that would centrally handle child-related policies, which is currently being discussed within the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. Child-related policies. Uh Uh-huh. What comes to mind, like... What toys to buy? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Prime Minister Suga, we want more dinosaurs. (laughs) So the establishment of a, quote, children's agency is expected to be included in the LDP's election platform for the next House of Representatives election. Regarding the movement, Minister Hagiuda stated that, I have heard that the LDP will consider the establishment of a children's agency. I hope that this will happen. The most important thing is to support the children who will support future society as a whole. And it is important for the government to firmly advance child-related policies. Okay, it's making sense now. So this is something they can just point to. It's like, it's for the children. Yeah, (laughs) it's for the future. So vote for me. (laughs) Or any questionable policies like... You, it's you for can't. the children. Come on. Exactly. Don't you like children? What are you, a child hater? <laughs> so the uh, Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare, Tamura, said that in addition to child care and early childhood education, welfare issues such as dealing with child poverty, children with disabilities, and abuse are also a large part of this. Uh, I want to coordinate with the party. Hope he's not going to coordinate on abuse. (laughs) Oh, God. Honestly, this is a pretty good idea if you think about it, because Mm. Japan has this declining birth rate. And one of the big reasons that is said are leading to the situation that Japan finds itself in with the declining population in the aging society Mm -hmm. is that Japan's policies are not aggressive enough to promote people to have kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They need to get some other kind of agency to help out with that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the Japan Make Children Agency. We're just going to call it the Sex Agency. <laughs> you know, we've talked to some people in Kabuki Cho and we've got some uh, advisors lined up to help out. <laughs> I wonder what the consulting fees for that project are going to look like. (laughs) After discussions, school kids in Japan choose to eat flounders they raised. The Mainichi has also reported that an elementary school has decided to eat olive flounders they had raised as a lesson on life after holding discussions on whether they should do so or not. Gotta say, olive flounders sound delicious. (laughs) We've got uh, green ones and black ones. (laughs) I guess it's just a kind of flounder. I don't know. Do you know anything about olive flounders? No, no, no. Actually, I'm quite uh, unfamiliar with this. Uh, Definitely not something you'd find at the Olive Garden in the U.S., I believe. Man, I have so many bad stories about the Olive Garden. (laughs) Dude, I have to say, I mean... Dear listeners, if you if you want to see a truly unattractive fish, just Google olive flounder. This this fish is not going to win any beauty pageants. <laughs> Dear God, yeah. I mean, just on Google Images, 
<laughs> it's a disgusting looking fish. Yeah, it's all slimy. It looks like a piece of slime. Um, <laughs> like if you look up salmon or something. Don't ruin salmon. Salmon is delicious. Oh, dude, I just if you if you Google salmon, dear God, like uh, the fish and you know the the food looks incredible. Um, like a salmon legit looks like it. if you caught that thing and ate it, it's it's gonna taste good. This uh this this oh uh, it looks good. Yeah, it looks like something you know if you're in the wild and you have to survive and you catch one of those bad boys, you're gonna have a great time uh, eating it. Yeah, um, it looks like uh you know it looks like a fish. Yeah, yeah. The olive flounder on the other hand looks like a piece of uh, brown slime. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> So the students at Kasukabe Municipal Edogawa Elementary and Junior High School ate the flounders on March the 24th after three discussions. They eventually took it to a vote and 10 of 13 students voted to eat the flounder. The lesson on life is part of an initiative that has been conducted since 2018 by the Japan Foundation's Ocean and Japan Project, and students in the fifth grade had been raising the fish at the school since October 2020, with instructions from the Japan Culture Organization. Ah, so eating the fish is Japanese culture, of course. (laughs) The class ate the fish in their home economics classroom. Organization director Koichi Saito, who used to be a professional cook, explained to the children that the phrase itadakimasu, which Japanese people say before eating, is about receiving life and is also an expression of thanks to the person who cooked the food. Saito then filleted a fish into five pieces as students nervously looked on. You know, I wish someone would have uh, given me that explanation for itadakimasu when I was learning Japanese. It's it's a very, uh, very spiritual uh, way of putting it. Well, Aaron, it's never too late to go back to elementary school. (laughs) What's that Adam Sandler movie? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? The one where he goes back to elementary school? I can only think about that meme, you know, the one with Steve Buscemi. Hey there, fellow kids. (laughs) <laughs> oh god oh yeah that that's so good that's so good hold on hold on right. how do you do fellow kids <laughs> uh billy madison billy madison yeah one of my favorite movies uh growing up i need to rewatch that <laughs> could you imagine if they had some like intercultural initiative where they got some random gaijin to like go to elementary school in japan <laughs> <laughs> It's for the children. It's uh, supported by the children's agency, in fact. (laughs) So after the Saito uh, filleted the fish, the students then tasted raw sashimi, slices of the flounders they had raised and ones that had been professionally farmed. One boy, 11 years old, who had said during the discussions that he had wanted to release the fish into the sea without eating them, commented after tasting the fish, uh, I ate it because we decided to do so together. But I feel sorry. Another boy commented, The one we had raised was more tender and tasted better. <laughs> After the class, Principal Manabu Kobayashi said, mm, I think that through raising the fish, mm, the students learned about the importance of cooperation, life, in the ocean environment where fish grow, okay? So this seems kind of a way to just normalize uh, eating fish after you raise them yourself. Um, Some might find that actually cruel. Yeah, and so that's one of the things that uh, always I notice as sort of a cultural difference between Japan and you know, different Western cultures. I mean, Mm. especially the culture that we grew up in, in America, because, you know, animals are viewed as being cute and cuddly and the whole idea of, you know, watching people kill animals and sort of the, the actual killing of animals is just seen as very cruel and evil, even though it happens all the time. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. that's where the food comes from. Right, right, right. You know, in America, we get uh, a nice little uh, Happy Meal that comes from, like, you know, 
uh, animals that are like in cages being killed with uh, animal characters on the Happy Meal. Happy teddy bears, right? <laughs> but, you know, uh, it, but it, as you said, in Japan, anything in the ocean is fair game. And that, that is very a cultural thing here. Uh, they will eat any and everything that comes from the ocean. And it's become a huge controversy. I mean, the whole thing with uh, dolphins and whales. Mm. And I mean, neither are very common or even, especially, I mean, dolphin. I mean, I've never seen dolphin for sale. And yeah, that, that was a huge controversy though with the, the the sea shepherd people and everybody made a big fuss about they're killing the dolphins and the whales and <laughs> Japan was like yo we've been doing this for a while and it wasn't a problem before what's the what's the big deal yeah yeah but dolphins are different to be honest with you if I was a kid and I had to like raise something and then eat it and then like watch a chef like dice it up in front of you know, you know, I, I, no, I mean, it would be like traumatizing for like American kids. For they'd, sure. They'd be like, sure. you know, in tears. Yeah. But yeah. these kids were like, you know, it was like survivor. Like, yeah. Oh, wait it. <laughs> this is the way we do it. Yeah. 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 I honestly, I love that part of Japanese society. And I think uh, it's, I don't know what it is about the, the way that, you know, we're raised in America that we just, why do we have to, to question something as obvious as, you know, killing animals to eat them so that we'll have something to eat? I understand that some people think that that's cruel and, you know, they're more than welcome to live alternative lifestyles. But me personally, I enjoy a good hamburger and I, I know that hamburgers are made out of cows and uh, I like cows. I think they're very cute, too. <laughs> but I also like to eat the cows. And if I had to kill the cow to eat the cow, I would do that thing. Yeah, I mean. But they're so cute. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems in America, you know, I think uh, I do have a friend who's an animal rights activist and he has quite a large following uh, and he's tried to advertise his artwork on Instagram, um, but it always gets blocked. And that's because, um, you know, the biggest advertisers in the world are basically, you know, it, it, uh, it undercuts them, right? If, if anyone's like posting about animal rights issues and the next ad you get is from McDonald's or some other, you know, (laughs) canceled, yeah, you know? So, I mean, um, it's, it's really tricky. Uh, but you know, I think, I think this way of showing the kids like this is how the world works this is uh the true nature of our current reality and the way things are set up um is is quite interesting uh in in america things are quite filtered right like uh these kinds of realities do exist obviously in america but we're not like directly told them or anything um i appreciate the directness uh, of, uh, of these kinds of practices in Japan and, and Sweden too is another country that has these kinds of things too uh, they teach kids from a very young age like you know and first we kill the meatball and then we eat the meatball <laughs> oh my god <laughs> wasn't gonna say that but there's a lot of like survival stuff you know they have to go through like and hurry up and kill the meatball or it's gonna run away <laughs> or, or hurry up you've and- seen Aqua Teen Hunger Force haven't you <laughs> Hurry up and get yourself out of the uh, the the ice water you fell into, where you're going to die, and just the, the realization of, uh, of life and death, right? Um, and how to protect yourself, because uh, it's a very brutal environment uh, up in uh, Scandinavian countries, right? Yeah, and you gotta put all that furniture together by yourself, and it's the hard life. <laughs> all right, and for those who don't know, uh, Tokyo Wave, we just had our one year anniversary. Ta-da! So coming up next, we have a special segment. It's Tokyo Wave looking back on one year of insanity. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Well, Aaron, it's been one year since we released our first episode, which was actually episode zero, and that was released at the end of March in 2020, exactly one year ago. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's been 
a wild year for the show and um, a wild year for the world. Uh, we started the show uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So. Yeah, you can go back to that year old episode of us uh, postulating on how long it would take for this pandemic to be, eh, it'll probably be over by summer, the fall. And <laughs> just, <laughs> just wait, it will go away. It will go away in the spring. <laughs> And we're still here and we're still wearing masks and we're still talking shit on the internet. Uh, we're, we're in a state of emergency right now too, right? Not Before, anymore. It oh, just, but it just finished. It just finished. But they're talking about doing another one? No, 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 no. Okay, good. good no good. more state of emergencies. Please, please God, no. Don't, 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 yeah, but you know, we we we've we've done this show in a state of emergency, which has been interesting. Um, trying to avoid the trains and commuting through Tokyo. Yeah, it's been pretty wild. You know, when we started doing this podcast together, I don't think either of us really knew what form the show was going to take, and so we we started with different formats, different segments, and for a while we didn't have any guests. Correct. And I think that's a little bit different than a lot of the other podcasts that we've seen. And of course, because of the pandemic and everybody just has a little bit more free time on their hands than usual, uh, everybody and their mother started doing a podcast. Oh, so yeah, yeah. even in Japan, there are several podcasts and they all suck. Now there are several good ones out there. But uh, most of them focus on guests and it's, you know, one guest, two guests, three guests, four, five guests, six guests, seven guests, more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely... They take the Dr. Shush approach. <laughs> I, I'm very glad that we started out the way we did and our listeners don't know, but we actually have some interesting edits of a beta, beta test episode, right? Yeah, like the missing episode that you'll never get to hear. <laughs> yeah, we'll never release it. It's too. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's not. It's not PG thirteen. It's uh, TVMA. <laughs> but uh, it's really funny. But it, it it was really fun going through that process and messing around and seeing how how frantic we could make the show. I think we settled for a more you know half and half approach where you know we report the news and eventually yeah we brought on guests which was awesome. Uh, I must admit, I was pretty nervous uh, before we started doing guests because um, I'd done podcasting before, but it was like we would do one day with the guest and then the second day we would do me and the same host and then we would, we would edit it like crazy. But the way we're doing it is much more live. We're, you know, uh, in real time interacting with the guests, which I think is uh, a lot more fun. But also, you know, that's easy to do after you've done it several times, but the first time it uh, it was interesting, but we had we had an awesome first guest. I mean, Jim Andretta uh, from Pirates of Tokyo Bay fame came on to be our first guest, and he was awesome and absolutely hilarious. Yes, yes, probably uh, that's like the best first guest because it was just really chill, uh, lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I must say though, you know, there, there's a lot of times when we have guests on here, it's like what do I ask him next? You know? <laughs> so, um, and then after that, uh, our good friend, uh, so what do you think about the color blue? <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, we had Matt Ketchum, uh, from Akia Hunter. He's been on the show quite a few times now. Um, and he, he's great. I have to say though, whenever we have Matt on, I feel sorry for the people who have to edit our podcast because we still bleep out the F word on this show. And, uh, <laughs> There are lots of F words to bleep out when Matt shows up. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And who can forget Christian Brew, who was kindly introduced to us by Jim Andretta, who did motion capture for Kojima. I mean, what an amazing experience. Yeah, that was so cool. Uh, meeting her and hearing her stories of working with Kojima. And her kind of confirming the uh, the weirdness that surrounds Kojima and his studio and his way it's like of working. The office is like everything is white, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You walk in and you can't, you don't know where the entrance or exit is. Like <laughs> it's, it's, it's like psychological mind games, I guess. Those video game people. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, another big reoccurring guest, Doctor Stephen Nagy, um, has been on the show. I, I can't even count. Maybe three, three, four times now incredible wealth of information and knowledge and experience, not just here in Japan, but, um, East and South Asia and just 
knows so much about the politics, the economics, about everything going on here. Every time he's on the show, I have no idea what to ask him. I feel like I'm like at an amazing college lecture and it's like, wow, I should be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, whenever Dr. Nagy's on Tokyo Wave, I always think, you know, I want to ask him something about China because I know next to nothing about China. And he has this huge wealth of information and all of these insights on what's going on inside the country, what's going on with Hong Kong. And, you know, I just, you know, watch NHK and I'm like, hmm. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, of course, we had Dr. Nancy Snow, who I have to say, I love having her on the show. I feel like when she's here, um, it's just the three of us are like back in the States, you know, like drinking whiskey or something. Because, <laughs> you know, we're all kind of from, you know, the, the south part of the U.S. And uh, yeah, I feel like we're just going to break out into like dueling banjos. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which and another incredible wealth of knowledge and information, uh, not just here in Japan, but all over the world, uh, China and Germany as well. Uh, yeah. So it's just so good to get her perspective on what's going on and what's been going on the past year, this extremely turbulent uh, year, including all of 2020. Yeah. And what a crazy year it's been for governments around the world and the challenges they have had and faced in trying to communicate with the public. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Dr. Snow being a specialist in that field has a lot to say. And then also uh, another, um, I think kind of reoccurring, we've had him on twice, uh, Benjamin Boaz, uh, the cool Japan ambassador. He's really fun to have on. Benjamin has like experience. Every time I meet Benjamin, I learn about a new experience he's had in Japan and my jaw just kind of drops. I'm like, you did that? Like with the Aikido episode uh, that uh, is uh, uh, came out last week. Um, it's It's just... <laughs> It just always blows my mind. It's like, dude, how much have you done here? Like, it seems like you've lived like three lives in this country, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, his ex extensive research on Mahjong. I mean, mm. I didn't even really know that Mahjong was that big of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, we had Kirsten O'Connor on the show. And she told us all of these extremely interesting things about how difficult it is to raise bilingual children in Tokyo and the different educational challenges that she faced as former head of the British school in Tokyo. Yes, yes, yes. It was so good having her on the show. I mean, it's definitely like the elephant in the room for couples and people looking to raise kids here in Japan. You know, where do you send them? Do you send them to public school? Uh, do you send them to international school? Uh, and there's no really right answer, right? Each each decision has its pros and cons. Uh, getting her professional advice on that was awesome. And then if you haven't already noticed that our guests are so diverse in their backgrounds, the guest we had right after Kirsten was Jesse Franklin, a an amazing 3D animator who has worked with the biggest productions. He was on the Sonic the Hedgehog movie as a... Light. He did the lighting for a lot of the 3D scenes. I mean, really amazing guy and, and so like laid back. You'd never know like, what? You did the lighting for this massive Hollywood 3D movie? This is crazy. He's, and he's won multiple awards. I think he's like won like every possible award uh, for like 3D art and animation. And he's killing it with NFTs right now, by the way. No kidding. Yeah, he keeps dropping NFTs and they're actually getting bids and stuff because his work is really, really good. Uh, he's definitely someone else I'd love to get back on the show. Then another great guest with an incredible background was Mark Davidson, the former U.S. diplomat and government relations specialist here in Japan. I have to say I have had so many conversations with Mark Davidson, but having him on the show and asking him questions about what's going on in the U.S. presidential transition, mm. I really felt like, ooh, I don't want to say the wrong thing because I don't want everyone to know that I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've had a lot of guests like that, right? Where, you know, we, we, we have to be very careful and, uh, we, we realized very quickly, we're talking to someone who's like, wow, they're, they're like a world renowned expert in what they do. Definitely. Um, <laughs> and I mean, the whole world of U S politics and political processes and presidential appointees and this whole system, I mean, you know, 
spending my entire career in Japan, I know next to nothing about how the U.S. government works. Oh, for sure. I hear yeah. there's this guy called Uncle Sam, and you know he is really good at getting people deals on used cars, but that's about it. <laughs> You know, and then after that, we had Mede-san, uh, the famous TikToker and uh, YouTuber. Um, he was so much fun. I definitely would love to have him back on the show. What a character. Um, I think he's just a natural born comedian. Uh, I've been following him on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, I mean, th- that was one of those times when, I mean, he's just so funny. It's like we were laughing, but I mean you don't want a podcast just full of, you know, us laughing like a bunch of little girls. No, for sure. For sure. You know, he just full of different kinds of impressions. Um, I think I've, I've even joked around, like, I'd love to get made on, on like a, a serious business call and, <laughs> and have him do the Gary, oh, Gary, man, the v. Gary v impersonation. Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. That was so funny. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. That was good. Then after Mayday-san, we had Riki Okanda, the Japanese drama producer, on our show. And, oh my God, I mean, how many times do you get to talk to someone who has worked on all of these extremely domestic Japanese video productions? And, I mean, working on really big shows. Yeah, her experience and the depth at which she's integrated into the Japanese production uh, industry here is is wild. Uh, it's it's absolutely incredible. Um, uh, I need to check if she has a book. If she had a book, I would read it. Just <laughs> hearing about all the different shows she's worked on. I mean, she's worked. She worked on shows that when I was started studying Japanese ten years ago, I watched those shows to study Japanese, which is kind of crazy. Meeting her here, um, and yeah, she was even saying like. Uh, some of the uh, guerrilla uh, film style tactics they use, like they'll actually use iPhones and whatnot. Like- yeah, yeah. And like the, they, the reason why you see so many f- scenes in Japanese films and TV shows on the roof is because you don't have all of these problems around you. And there's these huge problems with privacy and they have to blur the background all the time. And it's a big pain in the ass. So guess what? Japanese movies use roofs all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's <laughs> obvious if you think about it, but... Otherwise, you just, you know, well, I guess they just really like roofs. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah. Then after that, we had Paper Pat. And I mean, Paper Pat is massive on TikTok. You, Aaron, you didn't know that he was going to be on, but you follow him on TikTok. It's like, that's crazy. Yeah. The day he was going to be on, <laughs> I didn't know like if it was that Paper Pat. Um, yeah, he was the other paper pad. He's just, you know, made out of paper. <laughs> I think I think that week we hadn't really talked about who the guest was. Um, and then uh, I was looking through the emails and I'm like, wait, paper pad is coming here. Holy, you know, and then uh, and really this this is someone who I, I, I really, really like uh, the content they have on um, Instagram and TikTok. You know, he is very passionate about teaching here in Japan. He's not just a normal English teacher here. And it, it, he has very like heartwarming uh, stories uh, and uh, really, really good reflection too on Japanese society and the cultural exchange between America and the U.S. And yeah, it's it's just been, it was great having him on the show. It's also been great to just follow him on social media and his, his stories that he has here in Japan. Then after Paper Pat, we had David Wagner, the media training veteran. And wow, I mean, even talking to David quite frequently as we work together as well, I never really sat down to hear his story about working with the Japanese government on global communications during the right in the middle of the Fukushima nuclear crisis. I mean, what an experience. I mean, that's the sort of stuff that should make a movie about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, gosh, so many things he talked about could be movies. Uh, It was wild hearing that. He was one of those guests where I I just felt like I should have like a pen and paper out (laughs) taking notes, you know, just spitting out so much gold and uh, really just incredible um, experiences here in Japan that I didn't even know like uh, existed. I mean, like one thing he talked about, I really would have never believed possible when he was uh, talking about how he approached the Japanese government to help them with their media communications during the 2011 crisis. And they said yes. And they appointed him a position. We both know being here, there's limitations on what you can do 
being non-Japanese, but I mean, he just cut his uh, own way through the forest, you know, and created a, a whole new route for that really kind of helps us all in a way. You know, we've had so many great guests and also so many great recurring guests. I mean, talking about, I don't think we've ever sat down and talked about all of the guests we've had, you know, over the past several months. And all I can think about is, man, we got to get everybody back on (laughs) such, such great interviews and listeners. If you haven't checked out any of these episodes with our guests, you got to do it because, you know, you can ignore our bullshit and listen to some extremely valuable information by honestly, some of the funniest, most entertaining, and also the most informative people in Japan and really leaders of their respective fields. Absolutely. And the guest interviews usually start about 15 to 20 minutes into the podcast. So if you just wanted to skip to that and uh, cut out the uh, noise me and Parker make for the first 15 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) The noise. (laughs) So yeah, you know, looking forward, uh, the next year, um, uh, we have plans to get a lot more guests on, get these, uh, guests back on again that we've had that have been just such amazing wealth of knowledge, information, and stories. Obviously when things chill out with COVID-19, we'd love to do an event, a Tokyo wave event here in Tokyo. Yes. We also want to have more guests at the same time because right now we are set up to have one guest. And so it's a three person podcast. In case you're wondering the reason why we don't have, you know, chat line party style guestathons is because all of our sessions are in person and not everybody wants to share a conference room with a couple of potentially infected, uh, wily Americans from the South. <laughs> But so once, you know, that limitation is gone, then the sky's the limit. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to that for sure. You know, I think the guy who edits our podcast is going to fire us after hearing that we're going to have even more guests because he, who shall not be named, is an awesome dude, extremely experienced music producer, editor, and has so much vast experience editing all kinds of podcasts. Most of them, of course, much cooler than ours, but uh, we cannot tell you who he is or he'll kill us, but uh, (laughs) he's a really cool dude. Yeah, yeah. So for the next year coming up, we have a lot of surprises planned for you. We're going to have more guests. We're going to have crazier guests. I mean, that's going to be hard, but we're going to do it. Mm, mm, mm. Content, content. We should probably get our first Japanese guest, too. (laughs) (laughs) which our editor has told us multiple times how come you guys don't have a japanese guest (laughs) but (laughs) you know it's a bunch of gaijins you know we're like a tokyo american club with uh, headphones yeah yeah (laughs) but yeah thanks to everyone for uh checking out the podcast for the past year um it's it's really wild a year has already passed since we started uh this has gone by so quickly And yeah, we really want to ramp things up. As Parker said, we've got lots of surprises, um, lots of stuff that we can do and we will do uh, to make this more of a community and really connect everyone with um, all of these extremely talented people out here in Tokyo. It's a series of tubes. (laughs) (laughs) You wouldn't want to put the universe into a tube. (laughs) Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's the internet. It's like a series of tubes. You never heard that before? Oh, I thought it was the Tim and Eric universe thing. Um, (laughs) Anyways, anyways. The universe is so large. (laughs) But yeah, so to our listeners, thank you so much for checking out Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, smash that subscribe button. And if you have anything you'd like to suggest or potential guests, ideas for the show, Our lines of communication are open. Of course, we say that at the end of every podcast, but we actually mean it. And we're going to say it again today. So thanks, guys. And here's looking for a brighter and happier 2021. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave.